All right. Cool. Welcome everyone to Air 2023. <laughs> which was almost Air 2021. But we're incredibly pleased and incredibly excited to finally be in Philadelphia. We do want to start with an acknowledgement. For centuries, the land now known as Philadelphia was home to and cared for by native peoples. These include the Lenni Lenape, people of Lenape Hoking, and the Pushant of Delaware Bay, for whom this land has always been a space of teaching and learning. Land acknowledgements like this are important in recognizing the enduring legacy of settler colonialism, but they do not meaningfully adjudicate these inequalities which requires a sustained commitment to indigenous activism. No, no! All right, nobody get the punchlines by me not being able to control slides properly. All right, we would like to thank our hosts, Temple University and University of Pennsylvania for having us. In particular, Adrienne, Andrew, Jan, Larissa, and Jessa for being the local team. <laughs> Reflecting on our theme, revolutions. No? <laughs> All right. Um, in many ways feels sadly appropriate for the world that we live in to be thinking about revolutions in different and complex ways. Um, from our call for paper, we see the transition from a relatively optimistic thinking about what the internet might be best for to a slightly more pessimistic view of the world that it is part of today. Thinking about the connections between digital and social movements have not always been straightforward for us. And today, the trade-offs between visibility and surveillance and the relationship between digital revolutions to racial justice, anti-colonial movements, and the rising tide of white supremacist and fascist mobilization do require urgent and direct attention. And I think, sadly, just the last few weeks have made that even more evident, even more important. We are, in many ways, living in an era where, whether you like it or not, we all need to be talking about misinformation and disinformation as major drivers of what's happening in the world, which is a really different place for a conference like this than it was, say, 10 years ago. So, important grounding. On a less serious note, thank goodness, um, I have some housekeeping duties, but I want to take you on my journey to that housekeeping slide. Um, for those of you who've um, been with us since we first announced that we were going to come to Philadelphia, an announcement that we made in 2019, you will recognize Gritty, Gritty being the mascot of the Philadelphia Flyers, who is a, um, a creature, I guess, um, <laughs> who we have very much adopted and has been sort of the the unofficial mascot, I think we can say the official mascot now, in many ways. Now, we live in an era where it should be really easy to create bespoke images of Gritty. So I want to take you through my journey of trying to get an appropriate image for the slide I want to eventually get to. My journey involves visiting a number of generative AI tools and putting in the same prompt where I asked for the Philadelphia mascot Gritty, riding a hairy mastodon, wearing a face mask. Different responses were available. I would like to share what I think is the weirdest thing I've ever seen, which is the response to that prompt from Stable Diffusion. It is fair to say I do not know that much about ice hockey but I feel that there's something slightly odd going on. 
I'm not quite sure what the figure riding the green motorized chariot is for. I'm not quite sure why one of the hands of that figure kind of looks like an antennae from a snail. I'm also not quite sure what a Macedon should look like, but I'm confident something's being lost in translation there. But that's fine because many other generative AI tools are available. So, same prompt, we turn to Dali. What, what is, what is OpenAI's very best gonna give us? <sighs> I'm not gonna deconstruct that other than saying, I was a little surprised. <laughs> the color scheme is unique. The horns are surprising. The cycloptic nature of the creature on the back is very disturbing. And I'm not sure what's being written, if I'm honest. Right, what's next? All right, I was a little bit unfair. Stable Diffusion has a grown-up version rather than the one I used. Let's use the grown-up tool. Same prompt. We now have recognizably cartoonish images, but the longer you look at them, the less they make sense. The bird-like character on the quad bike, I initially went, oh, it's kind of cool. They're having a cup of coffee. But then I realized the coffee cup might be the hand or might be the beak. Not quite sure. And then I looked at the larger character and thought, that'd be really hard to use that hand. What, what could you actually do with that rather than, other than destruction? <sighs> what else is available? I had to turn to former presidents for assistance. I know that Axel is a, a particular wizard with um, Midjourney. Asked Axel to run the prompt through Midjourney. Got four images back, all of which were interesting, but I'm just gonna share one with you. Now, to be fair, Midjourney looks to have fixed the multiple finger problem. There are, I think, the right number of digits on the character on the back. Not sure how that's gritty, but we'll run with it. But then I had a question about legs. If this character is riding this Mastodon-esque entity, why is there a third leg? Is this a squashed, smaller individual who has had a really bad experience, but also, if this mastodon has vision more like a bird with an eye on either side, how's that gonna work? Questions remain. Adobe dropped their own version on the weekend. Same prompt. Now, there are recognizable masks here. That's a win. The entity being ridden gets a mask. That's a win. But where does the, person, or the figure on the back begin and end? This feels like a slow motion chest burster about to, in process, which is not a good thing for anyone. <sighs> Who else is playing this game? Well, Meta dropped their engine. We got Llama 2. What does that give us? Probably the most PG version. So this is, it's not really a mastodon. It's, it's a little elephant. It's kind of cute. And we have at least an orange figure on the back. But at this point, this has not helped my journey to try and get a, an image for a slide. One last try, and I did something I never ever thought I would admit in public. I used Bing. <laughs> and it worked. This is what DALI 3 gives us. A recognizable gritty, wearing a face mask, riding a mastodon. That is a win. Thank you, Dali3. I can now get to the point I was supposed to make, which is our housekeeping. So, having enjoyed that journey with me, um, nuts and bolts things. We do have a code of conduct. Hopefully, you will have had a chance to have a skim over it. There's nothing particularly complicated in that. It's basically kind of be nice to each other. What we will say about air is there is a usual presum presumption that people are taking photos, sharing things on social media. If you do not want anything shared from your talks, your presentations, it is a good idea to make that clear to people. That's probably the, the most important bit of that code of conduct. If 
there is anything or any behaviour that people feel is not consistent with the code of conduct, please let someone in the executive know. We will try and help the best that we can. In terms of COVID-19, clearly we do not have a masking mandate, but we do ask that if you feel sick, that you test and that you wear a mask for the good of the community. And obviously, if that test happens to come back positive, please do not attend the event. Please let um, ac at air.org know and we will make arrangements to work with that. The most controversial thing I'm going to say, we are encouraging this year that we do not spend most of our time on the platform formerly known as Twitter. X is not a particularly safe or friendly space for many, many of the people in the air community. This is not saying you cannot tweet if you desperately want to. What it is saying is we have an alternative platform we would like you to try if you have not already. Air.social is our own Mastodon instance. It is moderated and cared for by a group of volunteer moderators from the Air community. We can say that that will be the safest and clearest expression of community that you can experience for this conference. If you are already on Mastodon, you do not obviously need to set up a new account on air.social. If you want to, you can. Some people are choosing to fork their experiences, have a specific account for the conference, and keep whatever their other Mastodon existence is. You do not have to do that. But what you do have as an Air member is access to air.social that we would encourage you to consider using for the conference, even if it's just for these four days, to try it out, to see if it works as an alternative, because there is an onus on us as a community to look at other options. And lastly, hashtag police, can we please try Air 2023, not Air 23, if you would like the community to find you. All right, question. For whom is this their first air? Wow. That's really exciting. So that's about half the room from where I'm standing. Welcome. Um, we hope that your experience so far has been a really good one. We hope that you've been involved in the pre-conferences, but we also hope that you make the most of what air is. And air, in many ways, is a community where Hopefully there is a less boundaries perhaps than other major conferences you might go to. Air is relatively safe and relatively friendly and we hope that you feel that you can talk to everyone, that you can get involved. To help with that, our... No, go back, God damn it. Oh, there we go. Um, tomorrow uh, at lunchtime there is an air welcome picnic that is being, um, sorry, lunch social, which is being organised by Oz and Tom, our current and incoming grad student reps. You, two, you do not have to be at your first air to go to that if you want to, which has been a common question, so it's a good sign. All right, that's enough from me. It's incredibly incredibly heartening for me to see faces, real people, not Zoom bubbles in the audience. I hope you have a fantastic experience of the next few days, and it's my pleasure to introduce our local and program chair, Dr. Adrian Shaw, to welcome you as well, and to introduce our keynote speaker, Dr. Amar Jean A.J. Escoffrey. Hello. <laughs> there we go. Um, I am shorter than this microphone is, so I hope that it won't mess it up if I move it down a bit. Um, uh, our lovely president also neglected to mention the AOIR selfie game, which is just a fun way to get us to engage and use Mastodon. It is on the hashtag, and if you want to engage, you will be very excited by the prize. It is currently sitting in my hotel room. I will not tell you what it is in the hopes that you will play just in case you want to find out. All right. Welcome to Philadelphia, 
finally. <laughs> um, it was five years and one week ago that as I came up the escalator to the Montreal Sheridan uh, Hotel, Michael Haley pulled me aside and tried to convince me to propose Philly as the next North American home for AIR. We'd worked together for four years on ICA's board and most of what I know about conference planning I learned from him. As many of you know, Michael passed away in early 2020, um, but I think he'd be happy with how it all turned out. I do know he would have hated the online conference years though. So, welcome mostly because Michael Haley twisted my arm into agreeing to do this. And by twisted, I mean he said it in a nice way and I couldn't tell him no. For those of you who knew Michael, you know that. I'm particularly excited to welcome you to Temple University. This building was the original Baptist Temple opened in 1891, of which the university founder, Russell Conwell, was the pastor. The night school for working and low-income adults he started predates the building, but the night owls who began what became Temple University did take classes in the basement of this building. Since 1965, though, Temple has been Philadelphia's only public state-related university which coincidentally is the same year that Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. spoke in this very building. This is a historic city and Philadelphia, as you'll know if you have read our extensive Philadelphia guide, <laughs> or if you have seen National Treasure, <laughs> was where the Declaration of Independence and many of the battles of the American Revolution were fought. As with our 2021 theme, Independence, though, by picking the theme Revolutions, we wanted to not to be overly celebratory of what revolutions look like. We wanted to think about their contingent promises and failures, particularly as related to digital technologies. How have digital technologies been enrolled in revolutionary projects? How have the discourses of revolutions taken shape in projects of social justice, the reorganization of social orders, or as corporate manipulations of revolutionary promises? And it's for that reason that we chose our keynote this year, whose projects and whose body of work look at and offer multiple types of revolutions, from what kinds of storytelling are possible, to rethinking media industries and distribution, to rethinking what academic productivity even can look like. Amar Jean A.J. Escoffrey is the Margaret Walker Alexander Associate Professor of Communication Studies at Northwestern University. His research on the political economy of legacy and new media, cult media, cultural studies, and community-based research. Dr. Scoffrey is a scholar and producer exploring power in media and technology through creative R&D. He uses media, art, research, and development as a tool for community building, cultural critique, and experimentation. For 10 years, he has explored how the new technologies have transformed the arts of storytelling, production, and distribution. His first book, Open TV, Innovation Beyond Hollywood and the Rise of Web Television, published by NYU Press in 2018, argues the web brought innovation to television by opening development to independent producers. By 2008, from 2008 to 2014, he also ran Televisual, um, a blog focused on the evolution of TV and the internet. His second book, Reparative Media, Cultivating Stories and Platforms to Heal Our Culture, forthcoming from MIT Press, explores how to repair systemic harm and discrimination in media, technology, and research. Dr. Escoffrey engages industry and community-based organizations as part of his research. He has given lectures for and collaborated with the Sundance Institute, Vimeo, the SAG-AFTRA Foundation, Black Public Media, and more. He has juried television and video for the Peabody Awards, Gotham Awards, and Tribeca Film Festival, among others. His work has been recognized by the MacArthur Foundation and Field Foundation, Filmmaker, New City, Chicago Mad Magazine, and Seed and Spark. Dr. Escoffrey has also co-founded also co OTV, Open Television, a platform for intersectional television. OTV programs have received recognition from the Emmy Awards, Webby Awards, Streamy Awards, Gotham Awards, among others. Its programming partners have included the Museum of Contemporary Art Chicago, the Sundance Institute, and the City of Chicago, along with numerous galleries, community organizations, and universities. Artists supported by OTV have received offers from leading studios and distributors, including C HBO, CBS, and Hulu. From 2015 to 2020, while leading OTV's transition from experiment to independent nonprofit, Dr. Escoffrey and exec executive director Elijah McKinnon raised over one million in multi-year support to sustain its operations. Building on the success of OTV, he co-founded an incubator for intersectional film and television with Stephanie Jeter and Lily Wachowski. 
He's currently director of the Maid Lab at Northwestern. The Media and Data Equity Lab researches inequity in media and technology systems and experiments with cultivating equitable systems. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Escoffrey to the stage. Thank you all for having me. I'm just gonna grab my notes while they get the presentation up. Great. Hi. I'd like to thank the AIR Executive Committee, President Tama Lever, wherever you are, Coordinator Michelle Gardner, and my longtime friend Adrian Shaw, who herself is a pillar of service to both AIR, ICA, her university, and the gaming industry, uh, for giving me this platform to speak. As you'll see in my talk, I take the service work of platform building very seriously. It is humbling to be given a platform, particularly as a black queer scholar whose work is often perceived as marginal in our fields. I thank everyone who's done the thankless work of cultivating AIR as a platform to share our knowledge for over 20 years. As a platform co-founder, I know how hard this work is. Most of you probably don't know me, as I last presented here over 10 years ago. I'm sorry. I stopped coming because at the time, um, my research interests, including intersectionality and the political economy of entertainment, were not heavily represented here. And when I was on tenure track, I focused on convenings most likely to cultivate my networks, right? We all know that. Um, over the last decade, many friends told me AIR was expanding and evolving, um, but it's hard to start over and make new friends. Um, by the time I was ready, the pandemic hit and I stayed home, but I'm here now and excited to fully engage as my work evolves. You also notice that my name and title are different than advertised. I am honored to carry the legacy of Margaret Walker, who co-founded the Southside Writers Group, um, a shining example of Chicago's legacy of community-based production that I explore in my book. I've also adopted a new last name. Uh, I go into detail about why in the book um, that this talk is named after, but the TLDR is that I'm taking the last name of my grandmother who raised me, um, the game that she wanted to use but was unable to because of Jamaica's patriarchal laws in the 1970s and the challenges of immigrating to the United States. Um, the name Christian was a middle name that I switched to my last so I could go by AJ because most people mispronounce my first name, Amar, given to me by my mother. Christian represents my mother's devout religiosity, um, which is a source of beauty but also trauma for me as a queer person, one I could not free myself of in my early 20s when I went into grad school. I'm only now starting to align myself with a matrilineal lineage that is the reason I'm able to speak with you today. So, my upcoming work will be published under Amar Jean Escuffrey. You can call me AJ. Let's get into it, hopefully. Yes. So, I will start by showing how I understand recent harms in media and technological systems, which I will intentionally flatten um, and paint with broad strokes for argument's sake, but I'd love to spend time in the Q&A addressing some of the nuances and complexities of media and tech systems, but I just have to kind of get through a broad sweep of things. Then I will give an overview of how I entered reparative media work, followed by a lengthy discussion of how reparative research and development supports the cultivation of healing stories and platforms, concluding with where my work is going. I'll be making several exclusive announcements, so stay tuned to the end. Um, I'll be speaking from my specific perspective in the United States while acknowledging that US-based corporations have global impact. Um, I wanna remind those who might dismiss hyperlocal work that US cities contain global populations, as you'll see, and an important part of resisting systemic harm is holding oneself accountable to and cultivating solidarity in the places we come from or spend the most time. I also believe that local work is the first step to organically engaging the global in a non-extractive way, which you'll see at the very end with where my work is going. Okay, so enough framing. I wanna start by asking, at a time in human history when we are more connected than ever, why does it feel like our cultural divisions, our collective wounds are intensifying? The, in the United States, the systems connecting our cultures, media, technology, and information systems are perpetuating harms. In subtle but profound ways, they limit our worldview, our understanding of ourselves, our communities, and our planet. Here, I'm using an allegory of culture as an ecosystem whose lands are largely owned by for-profit-driven institutions, inspired by black feminist and indigenous ecological thought and more loosely media ecology studies. 
I think about fast food versus slow, locally sourced agriculture produced in biodiverse environments as a productive allegory to critique corporate media and tech's impact on our cultural ecosystem. We know that distributing fast food to the world benefits from unethical, unsustainable production. We eat plastic in our food, produced on farms that harm the soil and animals, served to us by underpaid workers who lack collective bargaining rights. Similarly, media and tech companies distribute most of the stories we consume and who decide, and they decide who gets to produce them, privileging what is fast, globally consumable, and profitable over what is slow, locally diverse, and sustainable. Of course, not all film, television, and social media is unhealthy or polluting. Media can offer incredible pleasures and tools for healing and building bonds. But the question I have is, do we have the ingredients available for the most edifying, sustainable cultural diet? U.S. media and tech systems prioritize developing stories and platforms to target distinct audiences for profit, but our communities need to cultivate interdependence and solidarity to repair the historical injustices that shape our cultural and physical environment. I know this has really aged interestingly. Um, healing these uh, injustices from 2018, including racism, misogyny, xenophobia, homophobia, classism, ableism, and other forms of hate, requires a specific method of repair, redistributing power more equitably to the historically disempowered. I'm here to argue that artists and storytellers are community organizers and cultural healers in this environment. Their stories, essential technologies for cultural development, and grassroots distribution, a key and underutilized method for for systemic healing. How do we understand US media and tech corporations' power and impact on our cultural ecosystem. I locate power in media and tech systems in their control over cultural distribution, how storytellers reach communities. Classically, in communication studies, we call this sender message receiver. But that formulation obscures the central role corporations play as message distributors, buying or developing story ideas pitched by producers to sell or distribute their shows on exhibition platforms for audiences who are the message receivers to consume, and that worked great. Moscow says this profit from the sale of commodities because they view stories and audiences both as products is a, quote, fundamental source of power in a capitalist society. Netflix is perhaps the best example of a global story distributor with nearly 250 million subscribers in nearly 200 countries. Netflix rose to power by combining what David Craig and Stuart Cunningham call Hollywood's Southern California strategy of developing and owning expensive productions typified by HBO, which inspired Netflix early on, with Silicon Valley's Northern California big data strategy of automating content exhibitions for audiences like YouTube. We will be cycling around this cultural distribution process a couple times throughout the talk to show the range of impacts industries have on our cultural ecosystem and how we can use distribution to repair these processes. First, the streaming studio system. Hollywood has been following Netflix's quest for fast digital distribution, having already secured significant ownership rights over what they produce. Every global media conglomerate in the United States has a streaming video distribution platform to exhibit their own productions. And it seems audience options are dwindling every year with the dissolution of cable. The emergent streaming studio system is not yet as integrated as the classical Hollywood studio system of the early 20th century, but it shares some important similarities. Most important is the seamless integration of production, distribution, and exhibition by an increasingly small number of large studios. The effects of this nascent compact ecosystem are evolving, but in the past few years, we can already see problematic developments for both storytellers, workers, audiences, and the broader cultural ecosystem. And I want to say here that I'm focusing on recent developments. At the end of the talk, I'll discuss how I'm looking at the broader history of harm that these industries have um, enacted. So first, in terms of development, the creators who write our stories have been f placing pressures on job stability. Increasingly, they have no right to own their intellectual property, and the WJ strike doesn't really solve that problem, nor profit from its global distribution as global streamers absorb the syndication or residual market. This inequity in story ownership is particularly troubling when you consider that most women and people of color have historically had less access to owning intellectual property, that black people have been property in this country, and that indigenous people have had land or property stolen. Lack of ownership challenges changes all creators' uh, relationships to the story they tell, since they neither have the power to keep their shows on the platforms, nor do they have, nor are they getting paid if it stays on that platform. Um, and I do think the strike did change that much. 
Um, we're starting to see threats to diversity and labor equality that coincide with industry downturns, even before the strike. The most recent Writers Guild data, for instance, um, shows that while the number of women and minority writers has reached population size representation, they remain underrepresented at the executive producer level, and those are the people who have the most power over the story and the most intellectual property ownership. Crew members like camera operators or sound techs who ex execute writers' visions are in demand but disempowered. In a survey I conducted of workers in Chicago where many film and TV shows are produced because of state tax credits, over 50% of um, over 50% said they had experienced harm in the industry. For a national sample, we coded anonymous posts from the IATSE Union's grassroots Instagram page in the month leading up to its vote to authorize a strike against the streamers, who, as you can see from the images from the account, were the primary targets of their campaign. Uh, my lab established 13 thematic codes based on the workers' accounts, including financial instability, issues with labor and financial distribution, physical health compromise, mental health compromise, long work days, pictured right with the sleepy eyes, fear-inducing circumstances, unfair compensation, threat of replacement, harmful effects on personal life, and pressure from management. Um, workers largely attributed these harms to the quickening of production timelines to meet consumers' demands to binge on streaming platforms. We may be seeing the repercussions of this kind of fast There we go. may be seeing the repercussions of this kind of fast story development in reductive storytelling once films and series are exhibited on platform. Uh, PhD student and Made Lab affiliate Jamie Cooley and I conducted an analysis of, quote, Black Lives Matter playlists on streaming distribution platforms and found a strong pl plurality, one in three, prioritized traumatizing narratives in the dark blue, with the other plurality focused on extraordinary lives of overcoming suffering in light red, giving audiences a limited view of race focused on sensational highs and lows as opposed to the complex every day. Um, interestingly, films and series that were not even black-led were almost as abundant as those foregrounding black joy. In this context, some have looked optimistically to open access platforms as a countervailing folk force to Hollywood's closed hierarchical streaming platforms. Though more open and accessible, social media is still a fully integrated system anchored by distribution platforms as sites as near of near simultaneous content development, production, exhibition, and audience engagement, right? I can have an idea, produce it, and deliver it to audiences in seconds, um, all controlled by a small number of corporations. My first book, Open TV, based on over 100 interviews with creators alongside trade press analysis and participant observation, has been accused, somewhat incorrectly, of perpetuating this op optimism over open access platforms. In fact, there is significant ambivalence about the promise of indie online labor throughout the book, as I saw the increasing expansion of corporate control over web TV. Where social medias offer open and largely free distribution to our cultural environment compared to Hollywood's closed system, they aggressively aggressively curate and censor what can be seen and said as they mine our sociocultural interactions for data. Offering our free or undercompensated later to these platforms has helped them develop AI and sophisticated marketing, te marketing technology to make them much more powerful than their Southern California peers. Social media platforms' power over representation mirrors legacy media power in how it shapes and ascribes value to who and what can be known and discussed and how. Today, these platforms have expanded access to the means of production and rapidly distribute a staggering number of representations, right? Tweets, videos, live streams. Yet most do so with ever-changing algorithms masked by proprietary codes. If power regulates co meaning through codes or rules, as Stuart Hall argues, corporate social media platforms have challenged researchers in determining what the rules of representation are. What we suspect is that platforms discriminate quickly, discreetly, and with constant adaptation, too often platforming purveyors of su supremacist forms of hate. Ruha Benjamin describes the current networked environment as the, quote, new gym code. Wendy Chun argues we are segregated because networks put us into virtually gated communities. Indeed, platforms' discriminatory practices are occasionally made visible, as the U.S. saw in 2016, when we discovered how easy it is for foreign actors to target us by political persuasion, racial identity, and gender, suggesting it doesn't take intimate knowledge of U.S. culture to engage in discriminatory marketing on these platforms. LGBTQ plus users across platforms have decried 
uh, takedowns of their speech. Oliver Hampson recently found stark differences in moderation where conservative participants' removals that often involved harmful content removed according to site guidelines to create safe spaces, while trans and black participants' removals often involved content relating to expressing their own identities removed despite following site policies. For years, black YouTubers complained about rising challenges to their visibility, causing YouTube to respond with a funded program, and black TikTok users uh, in, went on strike in 2020 for the same reason and because of widespread appropriation of their talents from other users. Meanwhile, all pl platforms regulate what words can be used, as we see in TikTok with users replacing sex with segs. The problem here is a lack of communi community accountability on tech platforms who undervalue the specificity of language, how its performance by specific bodies changes meaning. These platforms are everywhere and accountable to very few, and both independent analyses and now corporate whistleblowers suggest that despite their purported neutrality, they prioritize the most culturally divisive um, and historically empowered users. All of this moderation is conducted by underpaid workers who face incredible mental health stress as they sort through the worst things in the world. Even then, they face obsolescence as the AI they helped train takes over their jobs, challenging the value of human and community-based moderation. Platforms' lack of transparency over curation and moderation policies amplifies an information asymmetry that is a perpetual anxiety amongst creators who are just one mistake and one video away from demonetization or algorithmic invisibility. In all, this is not a sustainable media environment. So enough about the problems. I usually don't like to spend too much time on the problems. What does it mean to use reparative R&D to resist the extractive, divisive dynamics of media and tech industries and cultivate a more equitable, sustainable cultural ecosystem? I came into this hypothesizing that a focus on repairing distribution using community-based R&D could at least offer a framework for critiquing these dynamics and for actively healing the worst effects of the streaming studio and tech systems, even if this is only a Band-Aid on an open wound. I focused on distribution because it connects the development and production of stories to audiences or communities through platforms. Remember in media and tech it is the distributors who command power by brokering the exchange between sender and receiver. For me, any system Systemic intervention should integrate distribution into its conceptualization. Um, in my book, I theorize community-based distribution through the lens of the cookout, um, a form of black American ancestral intelligence where hosts cultivate platforms to invite or develop communities um, to collectively cook or produce and serve or distribute something nourishing. Hosts then cultivate knowledge on the process to ensure they do it better next time and that value can be equitably distributed. At the end of the talk, I'll speak more about how I'm putting this framework into practice, um, but you won't hear about the cookout until then, I'm sorry. This journey uh, started in 2014 when I started, saw an opportunity to experiment with a different way of distributing media. I was following historical trends that connect diversity and representation to, with changes in technologies of distribution, as described by Jennifer Fuller, Herman Gray, and others. Essentially, they found that the introduction of cable increased competition amongst distributors or channels, and therefore increased demand for black or other edgy representations that could lure audiences from broadcast to cable channels. Seeing Netflix's early programming orders, I hypothesized this would happen again with streaming and intersectionality, and I was right. I was also inspired by people like Issa Rae, a core participant in my first book, who, after years of unsuccessfully pitching series about black women to broadcasting cable channels, um, who were, quote, relying on the same formula, became a beneficiary of streaming's interest in intersectionality as likely the first black woman to have a show on HBO as they launched their first cable-free service, HBO Now, enticing black audiences with lower cost access to their stories. Seeing the coming wave of interest in diversity, I asked, how does intersectional TV develop? In television, there has never been, or perhaps has never been, a distributor explicitly focused on consistently developing stories about multiply marginalized communities. Intersectionality remains marginalized by both streaming and tech systems. It's com more complex to engage race in relationship with gender or sexuality, disability with nationality, or religion with ethnicity or race, etc. right? Distributors see it as exciting at first, but then realize it's harder to sustain engagement with multiple audiences. Media and tech platforms reduce cultural complexity to ease this process of marketing 
marketing to mass audiences. We saw this in the previous slide, right, with the focus on crime and race with both Oz, which helped establish HBO in the cable era, and Orange is the New Black for Netflix in the streaming era. I, hypothes I hypothesize that repairing this exclusion demands we prioritize culturally complex representations and experiment with new methods for their distribution. My book, Reparative Media, Cultivating Stories and Platforms to Heal Our Culture, now under contract at MIT Press in Ramon Lobato and Josh Braun's Distribution Matters series, argues that repairing our culture means reimagining distribution along the lines of intersectionality to heal how we make media, how we connect through technology, and how we as university or corporate researchers generate knowledge. It is about the subtle, powerful ways institutions harm how we see and value ourselves, but also how we can work practically toward reparation. So locally sourcing stories and platforming repair at the individual, communal, national, and global levels. Reparative media is based on five years of deep, productive, and complex work co-creating a independent alternative to networked media platforms like Netflix, a Chicago-based channel called OTV Open Television, developed in solidarity with black and brown queer, trans, and women-identified artists professional cultural healers. From 2015 to 2020, when I led the project, we released over 63 narrative pilots, series, short films, and video artworks, most of them were short form series, to an audience of several thousand people in Chicago and many more online, including over one million plays on Vimeo. If we consider, if we consider streaming and tech systems as cultural operating systems to draw from Tara McPherson and Kara Keeling, for me, OTV was an experiment in intentionally queering these systems, applying Keeling's notion of queer OS, operating system, to the spaces of TV and social media. I started this experiment with an open-ended question. Can producing stories and developing platforms to support people who've been harmed by multiple intersecting systems heal those systems. I have lots of evidence it does, but the real lesson for me was how practicing repairing systems demands we balance care for ourselves, our colleagues, and community members in service of cultural transformation, and how challenging but rewarding that process is. I learned how much connection is possible, even in a divisive cultural climate, when we redistribute power to those who've been historically denied it. But that process of redistribution is never ending and ever deepening. OTV offers a case study for broader systemic changes that are clear and concrete if only we can commit as much to repairing systems as we do to repairing ourselves and to critiquing those systems. Like all processes for healing great wounds, what I call reparative research and development is not simple, easy, or perfect, but its effects are immediate and backed by data. And look, here's the thing. Yes, reparative media is fundamentally anti-corporate, but it's foolish to think that we can cultivate new ecosystems completely separate from what dominates the current environment. Some of the data for its efficacy uh, are the ways it supported transformation in the industries we critiqued. It helped make media more representative of US and global cultures. Under my leadership, OTV programs received nominations and wins, as you heard, from the Emmys, Webbies, and Streamies, and more, exhibitions at major film festivals and museums, and creators went on to sell shows to HBO, Hulu, CBS, and more since then, while earning staff positions in those places and many others. Um, reparative media done well cultivates a more healing cultural ecosystem by both repairing the current system and planting seeds for a new one. OTV was an experiment in how to plant those seeds. The OTV experiment connects community-based research on distribution and the values necessary to sustain it. This is about inviting humanistic social science researchers to change how we engage critique. Instead of just pointing out harm, experimenting with systemic repair in the field in solidarity with our participants. In the book, I reveal how my team and I reconfigured towards repair both traditional qualitative methods, including um, 132 interviews with artists conducted after the release of their program, and this is me interviewing them publicly, but um, I, of course, interviewed them by phone privately, autoethnography of my meetings with Hollywood executives, 72 surveys of the Chicago community members who attended those exhibitions, and participant observation of 14 productions um, with more creative methods like participatory production, where I served as a producer or a director on 10 of those projects as a way to get deeper insight into the process, um, deepening something that I had already explored in my first book. I also discussed the quantitative or small data we use to hold ourselves accountable, including demographics, and I have more slides um, at the end if you want that, um, social media data, uh, online viewership, and or in-person attendance at 
in attendance at local screenings. In general, this grassroots process informed by intersectionality yielded storytellers who were majority black and people of color, women or trans slash non-binary identified and overwhelmingly queer. They were also largely college educated, evidence that some class privilege mediated by race and gender, of course, assisted in the development of indie productions. We saw similar de demographics in the audience from a sample of over 1,000 attendees of screenings in Chicago and in some of our online audiences, though platforms um, often only report binary gender and age, right, as Rena Bivens has um, discussed, replicating legacy media logics. Um, and I can, I'll discuss quantitative reception data in the reparative platforms section later. Working in the tradition of empirical community-based and locally specific research done with art and artists, beginning with sociologist W.E.B. Du Bois and anthropologist Zora Neale Hurston, OTV was a true experiment in open access data, designing for mutual benefit and power sharing, as evidenced by the fact that when I started to receive large grants towards the project, I was able to hand over leadership to the nonprofit platform to my collaborators. Since 2020, as the project has now raised millions, I only served as a board member, uh, supporting the full-time staff with grant writing, fundraising, writing the annual report, and advising the executive director. Researchers like us have a unique opportunity to experiment with cultivating reparative knowledge with the communities from whom we often extract data. We sometimes struggle to do this because of the ways our institutions incentivize short-term results and big data-driven or globally relevant theories of the humanity or society. To create new systems, I suggest we instead start locally and share power with communities surviving systemic harm. Experimenting locally scales our research so we can do it ethically, organically, and see the effects of our interventions in greater depth. Okay, so now that we've covered the Ba by basics of reparative research methods, I want to discuss reparative story development or the power of developing film, television, and online video stories informed by intersectionality. Um, structuring OTV to be a grassroots distributor challenged the norms of how films and TV shows are developed in Hollywood while also developing stories of interest to Hollywood. Disrupting Hollywood's business model, cultivating more complex, complex, connective, and collective stories. Instead of taking intellectual property like most studios do, we ensured creators retained ownership of their stories and in turn they shared ownership with each other. Instead of forcing creators to exclusively re release with OTV, we shared ownership over distribution non-exclusively, cultivating specific online and local experiences that built connections and bonds. Instead of requiring creators to have an agent to meet with a network executive, development was open. I said yes to every meeting I received, meeting request I received. What emerged from this open grassroots process is a true representation of what story creators wanted to tell in this period, unfiltered by platforms, demands, or strategies. We could not green light or buy shows. We didn't have the money. <laughs> All we could do is support storytellers in making what they wanted to do. This was organic representation, a stark contrast to what Kristen Warner identifies as the plastic representation produced in Hollywood. Reparative stories value the storyteller's unique perspective, unencumbered by executive notes that try to, try to fit the story into a di distributor's brand or their perception of the audience because they live in LA, they don't know who the audience is. By not giving notes, I was experimenting with TV, what TV might emerge if storytellers viewed their first audience not as executives for a network brand, like Hulu or Netflix, but as their community, because they knew that we would screen it in person in their community before it goes online. What we saw was that first, storytellers needed their community to fundraise for and make their project, which meant story to, stories were community accountable before they were even finished. Practically, to supplement the $500 to $2,000 OTV paid to non-exclusively license their series, most creators needed to crowdfund for their work, as seen here with our partnership with Seed and Spark, the leading platform for indie TV fundraising, um, though some teams also secured state and nonprofit grants that I assisted them in finding and pre prepping for. Uh, primarily through crowdfunding from their communities, artists raised well over half a million dollars to green my productions from 2015 to 2020. Um, this greatly exceeds the nearly $100,000 OTV gave to artists over the same period, uh, though that sum, 100,000, represented 60% of OTV's total operating budget, uh, showing how proportionally as a platform we valued storytellers as much as we possibly could. Once in production, it mattered that 
creators had control over hiring, who is behind the camera, that, so that who was behind the camera represented who was in front of the camera. This is very challenging to do in Hollywood because of unions and historically explosive social networks. Sam Bailey, co-creator of the Emmy-nominated Brown Girls that sold to HBO, they're pictured in the middle uh, behind the boom operator, recounted the importance of having a queer cinematographer when directing the coming out scene because she herself is not queer identified. She said, quote, I wanted the actors to feel like they were entering a safe space to tell this story without being exoticized or judged. So much of the talks around diversity in media begins and ends with the characters, but I think we do ourselves a disservice if we don't extend that to the people crafting the story behind the scenes. Um, and just as like a quick aside, if any of you follow Angelica Ross, who's been on Pose in American Horror Story, she's been like revealing these stories of how she was treated as a black trans woman on productions. And you know, imagine what it's like when you have to give your best performance and you're being literally aggressed right in front of you, right? This really curtails the kinds of stories we see on these platforms. Um, the healing power of collaborative production extended to story creation itself. Nearly one-third of OTV stories had multiple creators, including several with three or more. This changed the type of stories we saw. Um, I coded all of the 63 stories released by OTV in the first five years in terms of representational strategy, and these codes included intersectional friendship, ensemble stories representing love across difference, difference within sameness, and true anthology or decent stories, community as a character, or collaboration as a character. All of this suggests a community-based collective orientation to storytelling, emphasizing how we survive and heal together. OTV productions were trauma-informed, but not traumatizing. Only 10% or seven productions centered their narratives on trauma or violence, and half of those that did were dramas where all but le one left room for joy. The majority were stories of solidarity that decenter individual heroes and victims, remember the Hollywood BLM playlist, in favor of collective narratives that show the value, complexity, and diversity of marginalized communities. As an aside, of the few um, experiment, uh, so of the few solo works, most were experimental films and series resisting the norms of representation to explore the multiplicities within the self. Significantly, without consultants, rules, or quotas, I found no evidence from our community, team, or artists that any of our programs were deemed racist, misogynist, homophobic, transphobic, jingoistic, or ableist, which is not the case even for some of the early work of indie creators like Issa Rae. Collective stories in included ensemble productions like Ricardo Gamboa's Brujos about queer Latinx witches, which added many other witches of different identities and powers throughout the show. Um, Karan Sunil's, oh, that's, that's Brujos, sorry. Karan Sunil's uh, Code Switched, one of the few South Asian American stories anywhere, representing both Hindus and Muslims, Indians and Pakistanis in one narrative and Suhey Bondoy's uh, Arabica about a Palestinian-American community outside of Chicago being surveilled by the FBI, um, which is based on his real experience. His sister, Asaya Bondawi, actually did a documentary about it called The Feeling of Being Watched. Um, Arabica truly represents an entire community in one decentered narrative. Suhey told me, Quote, I started off in film exploring my friends' perspectives, what they thought of being in the community. I'd write scenarios that could have easily happened in that community. I feel like it was a space that wasn't explored, and by having so many connections in the community and being able to rally so much support, it was inevitable that these stories were going to be told, and it would be a shame if someone outside the community came in and told our stories. What's interesting here is that Suheb could have focused on the violence and the FBI. It's a very juicy, sensational thing, right? That's what Hollywood does. In fact, a Pillars USC study found that nearly 40% of Muslims them, primary and secondary characters in studio films and series were shown as per per perpetrators of violence. But Arabica marginalizes police presence to show the actual community, which is both specifically Muslim and Palestinian, but also very ordinary in other ways, revealing why they didn't need to be surveilled in the first place. Um, and I have to have an aside here. I must confess that this slide has been in my talk as I've pre prepared for this talk all year. Um, but several weeks ago, I actually removed it just to save time. I'm going to run like a little over 15 minutes. I'm sorry. Um, this was before the terrorist attack uh, executed by Hamas. Um, but after a six-year-old Palestinian-American boy from the exact community Suhaib dom documented, Wadia Al-Fayyum was killed by his Islamophobic landlord on Monday, I felt I had to put it back in. This, so this is not to misrepresent 
OTV, we have as many Jewish creators as Muslim ones, nor to draw attention away from the value of Jewish lives in this moment. Indeed, I won't be having coffee with a former advisee tomorrow because she and her family are currently unable to live, leave Israel. But rather, I put it back in to underscore a core tenet of reparative media, and I think one that is just really important to underscore right now, which is that every community has equal value. Across all these projects, we see much more complex humanizing representations of communities than in corporate media or journalism. I was actually most struck by the emergence of what I call the intersectional friendship genre, which is nearly non-existent in corporate media. It might have been an effect of the success of Brown Girls, but 20% of the productions in this period featured two people of different cultural backgrounds coming together to support each other, sharing the narrative equally, challenging cultural homogeneity and representing cross-community solidarity. These series expand narrative possibilities by taking seriously each individual character's journey while also showing where different struggles intersect. I really have to underscore that I, as principal investigator, had no influence on this outcome. Um, Representing cross-cultural solidarity was not cross-cultural solidarity was not a stated goal of the OTV experiment, so it took me by surprise. It emerged organically, solely by centering intersectionality and our local uh, community. For example, in United States of Aliens, Nikita Duke and Alicia Seth's characters, Reshita and Uduak, are Chicago-based immigrants from Nigeria and India, respectively. Here we see the global and the local again. They face issues common to many immigrants, like accessing healthcare or fearing deportation, but also face specific challenges. In the opening scene about calling family back home, Uduak's long-distance sexy video chat with her partner is interrupted by their country's poor internet infrastructure, while Reshita ends her video chat with her dad early when he starts talking about marriage after she mentions meeting one guy once. Sheff said that she and Duke explicitly collaborated to bring out these themes of the similarities and differences in cross-cultural immigrant experiences. Quote, we don't see multicultural friendships on screen. It's always like two brown girls or two white girls. Why? Because we live in a world where people of all backgrounds, of all races, of all ethnicities are trying to survive things together. It's almost like this support system that they're creating while surviving individual experiences. Here we see the importance of solidarity as a framework for guiding collaboration and more equitably redistributing ownership over the narrative. At the same time, we have to attend to harm in production in indie and corporate contexts. OTV has been undergoing a years-long process of more deeply understanding the challenges our artists are grappling with in indie productions. This work is challenged by low production budgets and staff capacity to support the most healing environments. My lab surveyed uh, Chicago's independent filmmakers, which I talked about, interviewed OTV storytellers who re released with us, and surveyed them in collaboration with the black non-binary-led independent research firm, MMG. While OTV's artists experienced less harm on indie sets than corporate ones, there were calls for more uh, guidance on creating conflict-free productions. The result of this data set is a set of resources and recommendations on how OTV can support artists in navigating conflict and harm. Among the things we are advising creators to do is slow down and make time for community building, intention setting, and brave space agreements, which I'll discuss later, at all stage of production, um, budget for restorative justice, conflict resolution, and intimacy coordination, and other harm reduction roles, and scale back production ambitions um, to allow time for rest and reflection reflection. So go slow, use less resources, very like anti-corporate ethos are also healing. Okay, so now for the internet researchers, we go from story creation to release. Um, creators create community, not just content, and that is a key source of their power. That create, creators cultivate platforms for community is not new to the digital age. Storytellers, artists, and entertainers have always brought people together. The ways TV shows and social media videos are released in a digital context underestimates the cultural specificity of place and the complex practices necessary for sustainable community engagement. Tech platforms push towards binging, whether on Netflix or TikTok, and refining the process of content delivery on purely technical terms while neglecting the social and cultural specificity of engagement. This leaves communities hungry for deeper engagement, having us feeling more divided as we watch in our private spaces. At OTV, we organized local premieres for every work before publishing them online to contrast what was possible IRL versus online. 
At the simplest level, we found consistently that digital exhibition expanded the audiences of the local, right? Most of the time, views online exceeded the local attendance. But the local still brought value in terms of building meaningful connections, expanding interdisciplinary narratives, as I'll show in the next slide, and offering storytellers notes on their projects from peers that are closer to them in contrast to the sometimes contentious or even violent online com commenting cultures. Drag queens and trans non binary artists like Shea Coulee are well aware of this relationship of the local to the global. For, year, for decades, they have been community leaders at the local level and now use social media to expand that globally, often battling a lot of hate from fans on social media platforms that is more rare at the local level. Performance at IRL premieres by actors and contributors to the piece are messy and, but organic and makes the experience unique. Film and TV are the most interdisciplinary mediums, and artists of color are often interdisciplinary as a survival strategy, right? Multiple ways to make money. We don't talk about how this molds unique artists and can be the beginning of unique experiences for audiences and contributions to art. No type of artist reveals this more than drag queens, in my opinion, um, who use their skills in makeup, costume, dance, comedy, and acting to bring together queer people who otherwise would not have spaces to go in the places they live. Um, though, of course, those spaces are increasingly under attack in the US and globally. Increasingly, artists started to reach out to peers in other cities to craft simultaneous, locally tailored releases around the country and the world. Brown Girls premiered in 16 cities from Seattle to NYC and London on the night of its release in February 2017. Yes, two weeks after Trump's inauguration. And, the, and three series have subsequently repl replicated this practice of simultaneous in-person um, national and international premieres. I interviewed hosts of half these premieres. Um, these premieres are all unique, often featuring live performance or tie-ins to local artist communities or activists, supporting local ecosystems in deeper ways. Some were intimate, including one in Miami that featured only a handful of students who were nonetheless inspired by the show, to one in New York where 400 people showed up for performances um, from luminaries like Late Night with Seth Meyers, Arpana, Nan Churla. Here at the packed Brown Girls premiere in Chicago, we can see how a local platform can showcase different kinds of women of color artistry in cult culturally specific ways. This form of exhibition brings people together, forges connections across identity lines, and supports connections amongst artists and producers, which can lead to more opportunities for collaboration and story creation. But we can also research the value of culturally spe specific exhibition online. Here, um, all on the same night of its 16 city, city locally curated release, we see a selection from a sample of over 1,000 tweets um, how identity figures prominently in responses about the show, perhaps not surprisingly given its name. And of course, Andre Brock is here, and we all know that Twitter is a space for culturally specific conversation. I view the prevalence of identity here as reparative for its focus on how specific intersections of historically marginalized identities create unique forms of solidarity in a corporate social media exhibition space that re reduce the interdependency of their identities for the purpose of algorithmic targeting or segregation. This was about black and brown women, queer and straight, seeing themselves in each other. Audiences are clearly attuned and attracted to the messiness of how representations are cultivated in narratives, and their engagement reveals these interdependencies, which are often unpredictable, like in my favorite tweet, using a bag of white bread to discuss mainstream, mainstream queer representation, uh, in contrast to the fat Latina that opens brown girls. Identity is critical to how stories circulate online. Communities are trying to find each other online, even as platforms may be segregating them away from each other. In an analysis of views from press and other websites embedding the trailers of the show, from Facebook and Twitter to Time Magazine and BlackGirlNerds.com, we found the scale of exhibition from identity-specific sites constituted a strong plurality of brown girls' views. With different communities coming together to watch the same same show, this suggested that intersectionality resisted networked segregation to cultivate networked solidarity. For Brujos, identity-specific sites also exceeded loads on platforms. Um, you can also see how the creators themselves are key drivers because they, of course, best represent identities' intersections. This is not to downplay, downplay the role of social media platforms. Um, indeed, it is likely that many viewers found out about Brown Girls and Brujos uh, from social media shares of articles from identity-specific press. Yet, there is strong evidence that coverage from publications consistently covering specific identities indicated to viewers that these shows were, quote, for them. 
Because these shows prominently featured complex stories across normally segregated identities, queer and Latinx, black and brown, their exhibition drew in multiple disparate but intersecting communities. This suggests that if social media platforms focused on supporting intersectionality and also independent community-specific journalism, they could bridge divides and support solidarity over division. OTV is continuing to deepen our understanding of equitable online engagement. What does it mean to take best practices for holding space in real life and translate them online? In 2019, I hired Jenna Anist, um, who's pictured in that little video, as our first head of community, who, inspired by the work in Chicago's black feminist abolitionist spaces, researched and developed, quote, brave space agreements for our Chicago screenings, then for our workshops and productions, and finally for our online screenings, pictured here, um, is a video we showed before each, each online live stream when we had to shift, to, um, shift from in-person premieres to the web because of the pandemic. Um, imagine if global platforms introduced themselves to new users by playing a video like this. I agree. I agree. I agree. I agree. I agree. That my gifts offer value to this digital interaction and I accept the gifts that this digital interaction offers me to recognize and embrace cultural differences while interacting socially on here. To be playful, if my spirit allows, and joyfully engage. There is power in transnational communion. I agree to struggle against racism, transphobia, body shame, queer antagonism, classism, Misogyny, ableism, homophobia, xenophobia, shame, and other harmful systems, digitally and always. I said digitally, digitally and always. I agree to be accountable for what I do or say in this space and lead with respect. R-E-S-P-E-C-T, find out what that means to OTV by going to weareo.tv slash engagement. I agree to handle conflict with love. I agree to handle conflict with love. I agree to handle conflict with love and recognize that there is always room to disengage. I agree to handle conflict with love is something that I just need to say myself every time I sign on social media. Um, this kind of reparative practice has, praxis has limits in the present and there is a need to investigate systemic repair. So I am co-writing a short book with Dr. Khadija White at Rutgers on the concept of media reparations, which has been understudied despite growing interest in researching reparations, including as of 2020, 2021 at the congressional level, as well as in like Illinois, California, like reparations are happening. Um, we ask if there is utility in devising a broader, historically rooted framework for understanding harm in media. Khadija proposed investigating the themes of exclusion, extraction, and distortion over the last 100 years of US media, the period covering the emergence of mass, media, mass mediated profit driven systems. Reparative media, on the other hand, is a framework for how to organize now with whatever we have to heal our media environment in absence of and perhaps in preparation for a systemic change. It acknowledges reparation will be an ongoing practice, not an end goal, expanding beyond only material concerns to imagine repairing our culture. It honors storytelling as a technology for expanding our understanding of ourselves and our world, and platforms as critical technologies for distributing those stories. For this reason, repairing media is critical to repairing everything else that ails our society. From climate change to income inequality to identity-based hate, we will not repair harms to the environment or to people without a shift in consciousness in which media will necessarily play a part. I believe the reparative media framework moves us away from debates, debates and reparations motivated by scarcity of who gets what from whom and how much to an abundant, exciting project of reimagining how we care for ourselves as a locally accountable global culture. And I do wanna conclude with just a few more slides if you'll bear with me on some ways I'm putting this into practice beyond OTV. Um, reparative media is a practice and um, do this correctly, I did not copy. 
Yes, well, no. And the cookout offers an accessible, fra accessible framework for structuring this practice. I'll be applying reparative media development and production as practice as a co-investigator, supporting PIs Catherine Makapakal, Nathan Walter, and Brandon Hill in pre-bunking vaccine misinformation using culturally specific social video narratives by and for youth of color for a five-year grant from the National Institutes of Mental Health. I am exclusively announcing here, just for air, the launch of an original Afro-Indigenous futurist comic, The Cookout, a guide to AI ancestral intelligence, developed in collaboration with Vanderbilt, Vanderbilt Pol Professor of Political Science, Emily Ritter's Sequential Potential. Um, they make comics for academics to communicate our theories to broader audiences, so they're great to work with reach out to them. The comic explains the theory of reparative media and technology, and is also a handbook for storytellers, organizers, and academics can use to see their projects and collaborations through this lens, including insights and organizational documents that OTV used to develop our platform. Um, in advance of a print run in 2025, I'm using this digital version to beta test the applicability of the theory for ancestral of ancestral intelligence um, and the method of the cookout. So please send feedback if you download this. This is work in development. Um, I'll also have a short piece for commonplace on ancestral intelligence as it relates to artificial intelligence coming out in a couple weeks. Going forward, I'm scaling my interest in reparative media from the organization level to understand inter-organizational networks. Over the past 10 years, more organizations led by systemically oppressed people have emerged, and since 2020, more have been interested in creating sustainable coalitions. Since 2020, Chicago's media coalitions run by black and people of color have been working in coalition to develop collective funding and programming. This will be the first instance of me using the cookout framework to present a case for funding a new media ecosystem starting next month, if all goes well. Um, thanks to a grant from the Wallace Foundation, let's leave it all up. Um, I'll be scaling from the local to the regional, partnering with Detroit Narrative Agency to research by POC film and media organizations in the Midwest, culminating in a convening in 2026 where we'll experiment with co coalition strategies. Nationally, on the right there, I hosted a virtual convening of organizations doing this reparative work at the 2022 Allied Media Conference, all of which is available on my lab's website. And globally, thanks to a grant from Humanities Without Walls, I'm working with a group of black trans artists, activists, and scholars to create a network of storytellers across North and Central and South America. All of these coalitions will need a brave space to meet, share knowledge, and even share their stories, e.g. data and intellectual property. In the coming years, I hope to experiment with using the cookout for social networking and collective, the collective development of data and intellectual property. As Robert Gale has noted, uh, alternative or new social media networks continue to emerge as users seek more decentralized platforms for specific cultural practices in contrast to tech corporations' centralized extractive policies. What, what capacity exists to cultivate digital space for black and indigenous liberation, gathering artists, community, and academic leaders and allies away from the toxic algorithmic social media platforms we now use? What would it mean to have an app where you must be invited by a community member who offers accountability for your invitation designed to share rep recipes for liberation, guided by transparent hosting protocols in inspired by our past and collective knowledges whose data is owned and shared by its users. What connections and intelligences, ancestral and communal intelligences, might this manifest? Using our different, differing social ancestral intelligences to create incentives to share our knowledge and stories, this project will investigate data sovereignty outside of corporate structures and could potentially advance our understanding of the uses of community-based ancestral slash artificial intelligence. This is a new project, so if you're interested in joining me on, on this journey, just send an email. All right, we're wrapping up here. This may sound like a lot, um, but there's a consistent through line here uniting my interests in reparative research and development. I view black and indigenous artists and organizers as professional cultural healers and under-recognized innovators in systemic repair, whose stories are technologies for cultural transformation. If the future of digital technologies will deepen its engagements with property relations and the future of cultural production and social engagement inextricably linked with AI, artists and other creative workers will be critical partners in critiquing the systems and experimenting with strategies for harnessing community ownership and intelligence in service of a healing cultural environment. Thank you. Um, I'm told that we have 
some mics here and here for questions. And I'm told there's a mic up there, though I don't see it. Um, I know that was a lot, don't be scared. <laughs> Thanks, Andre. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really happy to see you. Oh, thanks. <laughs> Hi, thanks Hi. for an incredible talk. So I was wondering if you could talk about some of the challenges of doing this kind of work within the academy, which is often not super open to the kinds of research that you've been doing over your career. Yeah, thanks. Um, so I want to save, I want you to buy the book. There, that story is in there. <laughs> um, so I won't tell my tenure track story right now. It's in the book. It's juicy, okay? <laughs> buy the book. Um, it comes out. But, you know, I think that for me, like, just the concept of a clock is antithetical to this work. Like, you know, getting to know people, building meaningful relations, building trust, doing all of that, and then having to have an output of like publications is just really difficult to do. I mean, I did it, I don't think, to be honest, very well. Like, the articles that I churned out on Change Track are not my best writing, I don't think. You know, I kind of just did it for tenure kind of thing. Um, so I really, I think we in academia have a lot of rethinking to do about what we consider productivity. and. Universities are doing this. There are a lot of universities now that are integrating creative and community-based work into their tenure guidelines. I think that has to come with a loosening of productivity standards and an understanding that like work will be in process. I also just think like the structure of academia, which is large, like the corporate university, is makes it just really hard for anyone besides someone like me at like a really wealthy university that will give you tons of course releases and graduate student labor and a startup budget. Like it's just really hard to do this work without it, especially if you're trying to chart a new course, you're probably doing something that funders aren't already funding. And so you need that startup funding. You need those institutional backing um, to like get something off the ground, you know? And even then it's a lot of work and hard to do the research on teaching and service on top of all of that. So. You know, I, I, I give this talk and sometimes I feel like, I fear that people think I'm saying, you should do this too. And actually I often tell junior scholars, don't do what I did because you have to be resourced. You have to have some job security. Um, I really only did it because of those, like what I talked about, those like cycles of inclusion with Hollywood and I just really wanted to help the writers and directors that I knew like get jobs in Hollywood while the doors were still open because the doors are literally closing right now now that I'm tenured and I would not have had the same effect if I had started it later. But um, yeah, do it when you have the resources and you know, build power together and go up to the administrators and say like, hey, we need to do this work. There's, it's not just me, there's other people who want to do this work um, and try and change university policies and funding structures. Thank you for the question. Thank you so much. So much food for thought. I am curious if you can share more about the framework of the cookout and how you came to that and how you brought that into this work. Yes, thank you. The cookout. Um, I was getting reviews on the first draft of the manuscript and people were like, you need a coherent narrative to tie all this mess together. Um, and so I was thinking like, what is the, what is the structure behind everything? And God, what was the eureka moment? I think I was just maybe going through my photos and just like from my iPhone and realizing um, that I cooked for a lot of people in this project. Like I hosted a lot of dinners at my house to build trust with my artists and community. Um, and then, you know, in our earlier exhibitions, we had more kind of like 
artisanally crafted exhibitions. Um, like you saw photos of like our big screenings at like the Museum of Contemporary Art where it's like more traditional theater stuff, but we did a lot of like working with really small community organizations. We have just like hors d'oeuvres from a local vendor, right? And real gathering and stuff. So I, I just started to think like, I needed food to bring people on, to invite them, right, to develop their projects with us. And we needed food and like these community gathering practices to get audiences for this work. And, it, and then I was just like, well, what is that? Um, and actually my family back in Jersey where I grew up like hosted a lot of cookouts, you know? And so it was just something that came to me when I was thinking about um, the ancestral piece of everything. Because in the acknowledgments of the book, I actually talk a lot about my family history and how the literally hundreds of years of my family history led me to this point. Um, which goes into the Escuffery name as well. Um, so there's more to that story as well. And I was writing about my mom and dad, you know, and my dad would like, was on the grill, you know, and my mom um, is like a fabulous black woman. So she'd put on a great outfit and like charm everyone and make sure everyone was like doing well. And I'm like, okay, well, I must have learned how to do this hosting thing from somewhere, right? And so I really encourage everyone in this like ancestral intelligence frame to like go back to the practices that you and your family have had in this AI age, we need to root ourselves in what has helped us to become human for generations, right? And it could be the cookout, it could be, you know, it could be um, uh, astrology, you know, it could be, you know, um, uh, tribal dances, you know, whatever it is, find that inspiration um, from where you come from. Excellent talk, and I, I noticed that you really concentrated on the harms within the industry, right? And I was thinking at first, oh, like the audience harms of all the TV I've ever watched and how it's harmed, you know, my, my intellect, everything. And I was wondering if you're going to give some thought or you're, I mean, there are messages here I see that are going to repair some of the audience, right? So if you could comment. Yeah, the, the, the harms that this content does on the audience. So, you know, I think it's so complicated because these corporations release so many things, right? So there's like almost 600, well, we're gonna go down this year, but like last year there was like 600 scripted film and TV shows released. That doesn't include reality or like news or documentary or anything like that. So it's just a lot of stuff, right? And then you've got TikTok and Instagram and just like the glut of, so it's hard to say anything super general about that, but you know, Black writers, women writers, queer writers will talk about the narratives on these, on a lot of these shows as flattening um, because a lot of their a lot of the rooms don't represent all of the characters in the show, right? So you get this kind of like reduced complexity for characters who are historically marginalized. That's really hard to study quantitatively, but it's something that writers talk about. But I think almost, and this gets me kind of dipping into media ecology a bit, which I don't totally agree with, but like there is something to just like the never ending onslaught of representations, right? The more representations there are, the greater, the lesser the value of each individual representation, right? And so we're almost in this space where we see humans and characters as kind of like, okay, well onto the next, onto the next, onto the next, onto the next, you know? And there is a part of my work, I don't say this explicitly because I'm afraid to say it in some ways that like a reparative media ecosystem has fewer stories and they're like less big and glamorous than like Marvel and Stranger Things. You know, like these stories are just super small and like if everything we watched was just what was created in our local communities and local communities elsewhere and they were all like, the whole show was just an hour long because no one had the money to do a 20 hour show, you know, like how would that change our relationship to stories? How would that change our relationship to storytellers? We would have to spend more time with each piece. We would also be encouraged to go out into our community to meet the creators, to meet the actors, to put more flesh and complexity behind these digitized representations. I mean, I'm not gonna win that battle, <laughs> you know? Like, we're gonna have lots of TV shows and films, right? So I feel like this reparative media work is like in that context, I guess we should just try and do something else and have a different relationship to these digitized stories because of, again, how many of them are made and because they're made so quickly, I think they're not made with as much care. Did I answer your question? At least partially? Yeah. Cool. Thank hey, you Lynn. for the talk. Hi. Hi. 
I so enjoyed the I Agree video, and I would love to hear more about the thought process behind doing that kind of concept work in video form, and what, if any, the, the, the reaction or the reception to it has been. Which video? The, the I Agree, the kind oh, of reimagining terms space of agreement. service. Yes. Yes. Um, reaction to it. You know, I don't, I think, I think by the time we did that video in 2020, I think our specific community kind of expected that from us. Um, so maybe, I can't remember the first time we did it. Maybe the first time we did it, people were like, oh, this is great. And then it kind of became routine in our community. Um, I will say that when we've done it in smaller in-person spaces, like when we've done it with workshops with writers and stuff, I mean, everyone always says like, thank you so much for inviting me to feel these things. I think we don't talk about some of the ways in which if you have an identity that is historically discriminated against, sometimes you just need an invitation to step into your own power, which is what those really are about, right? Like, sometimes people fear, like, raising their hand and say, hey, you said that thing that kind of made me feel some type of way, right? And this invites people to do that. So we've heard that in intimate spaces where people are like, oh my gosh, this is great. And frankly, ever since I've been introducing it, inevitably someone in the room who is an organizer of a different space tells me, like, can I use those? And I, like, send them, like, who do I credit? I'm like, you can credit Jenna, you can credit let us breathe, but you know these are communal agreements. They're collective intellectual property. Um, so they have actually proliferated in like a lot of other organizations that like I work with. If I give a lecture and I show this video, they're like, let me use them. So they're like spreading kind of organically in that way. Hey Jabari, what uh, up? Uh, if I can just uh, interrupt, uh, we're gonna take these last two questions and sure. then thanks. Um, phenomenal talk. You talked very briefly about using the local to think about the global um, from a sociological perspective and from a South Side dude from Chicago perspective. I wonder if you can talk a little bit more about the Chicago context and its importance to your work. Yes, ooh, I love this question. Um, Chicago comes up in both chapters in the book, both the story section and the platform section. From the story section, Chicago is I'm so glad I get to say this here on YouTube. Like, Chicago has the history in social practice art. Like, Chicago is the place where artists have, for literally over 100 years, gotten together and said, hey, I know you're a great artist and you have your own work and I have my own work, but we're gonna like build something together from, like I mentioned, Margaret Walker, Southside Writers Group, to um, AACM, to, I mean, just like Honeypot Performance, who I've worked with, just like, in theater, in music, in poetry, just like across forms. And that, in my chapter, I go into that history, which is a very fun history to talk about. Um, so in some ways, you know, I talk about the effects of this reparative R&D process and the way that, that we have these collective stories as being an effect of our process, and I do believe our process had influence, and yet I also think it was a Chicago thing. You know what I'm saying? Like, I think Chicago folks just think collectively more so than other cities. I think because we're not in New York, San Francisco, LA, which are hyper-competitive, where global capital has really entrenched itself, right? Um, and then on the platform side, I think it's, it was really important for me to meditate on Chicago being, you know, one of the most segregated cities in America. It's almost like its tagline, you know, like, Chicago, one of the most segregated cities in America. Um, which is so horrible because it's such a beautiful city on, in so many ways. But there is, that, that's, that's a dynamic, right? It's got this history of ethnic enclaves. Um, and I think what was important for me to show is that that form of segregation um, is also happening online. I, I do believe Wendy Chun, right? And that the idea that like the social network theory on which these platforms are based are kind of regurgitating um, segregation from mid 20th century, right? Um, as well as eugenics through statistics. And so, um, it was important for me to do those demographic surveys when we did screenings in Chicago because I wanted to know where are people coming from and like what are the identities of the people we're bringing together. Um, I won't say that we healed all of Chicago's segregationist <laughs> dynamics because um, that is certainly not true, but I think we certainly did better than a lot of other Chicago organizations that were working at the same time. And I think at the local level, you can do the intentional thing of like making sure when you're having a screening, inviting someone from the south side and the west side and the north side to screen their works together so that you are bringing people together, right? Like it's so much harder to do that work of cultivating solidarity on digital platforms. Uh, so um, 
I'm going to ask a question about the circuit, so I apologize for ending on theory, but <laughs> as a kind of Birmingham school enjoyer, it is something I'm interested in and something I kind of, the question I struggle with as well. So I was wondering, I suppose in short, how you account for what I tend to refer to as intermediaries. So I agree that distributors are obviously very important, but with things like, say, for the sake of argument, YouTube, it also is very dependent upon AdSense. So in a kind of Stephen Luke's way of um, who gets to set the agenda before anything actually happens, advertisers play a hugely pivotal role as well, obviously. And then secondarily, those who are subterranean in the sense of data centers where this data gets stored 33% or something of Western internet is stored with AWS, for example. How within a reparative circuit or any kind of uh, you know, shirt hall influence circuit, do you and hopefully then I <laughs> can account for these <laughs> invisible intermediaries who aren't as present as the actual distributors, but nonetheless ideologically with a capital I and capital Ys inform and shape and constrain these distributors as well, if that makes sense. Yes, thank you. Um, so we uh, actually didn't upload to YouTube, we uploaded to Vimeo because of some of the dy dynamics you're talking about. Vimeo is more of like a filmmaker services platform, but they don't censor, they don't take down videos um, like YouTube does. Um, so you can like have things like nudity. Um, they also don't like push things down algorithmically if it has like the word pussy in the title, which one of our projects does. It's actually a really beautiful art piece from a trans artist um, that showed in galleries, but like was not visible on any advertising-based social platform. Um, we could not advertise for that on Facebook because they have advertisers, and if it has a bad word like that, and I realize I just said it and we're on YouTube, so now we're gonna be <laughs> demonetized. I'm sorry, Air, for that. Um, <laughs> But uh, yes, so we could see those kind of hidden intermediaries work in that way, particularly on Facebook, which is such an advertising heavy platform. Like certain projects that had certain words in the title that weren't advertiser friendly were kind of pushed down. And then also when we would download the demographics from the audience on those platforms, I mentioned this very briefly, we would get like binary gender. They would say our audience was like, you know, 50% female and 30% male and I'm like, what's the other 20%? Um, and we you know, did our own surveys in Chicago, and of course we knew that we actually have a huge non-binary and trans audience, right, that, don't, that aren't visible to platforms in that way. Um, so yes, I think that, to answer your question, I think, um, when I locate harm in media, I think distribution is key, but absolutely there's a network of a variety of institutions and organizations from advertisers to music licensing companies, right, to industry associations that shape what is visible, what is seen, and how things are developed, especially on these open platforms. You know, in streaming, as things, things are moving to subscribers, there's different logics that are emerging um, that I think we're just getting used to, though I will say when we think about Netflix and the hidden algorithm, right, targeting us, I think it's both overblown, right, like I think mostly Netflix mostly just promotes Netflix originals, um, but I do love and consistently cite um, the, art the article from Blake and Ted on the early stages of Netflix's algorithms and this idea of like lowest hanging fruit. I feel like that's such a productive allegory for thinking about what algorithms serve us story-wise. Um, and I think about us as an intermediary really trying to get you to the best fruit on the tree. You know what I'm saying? That makes sense. No problem. All right, if we would all uh, join me in thanking AJ again for such a wonderful keynote status. Thanks for staying. Now you may all go. <laughs>